our parable of the prodigal son this morning is the longest parable in the Gospels and arguably one of the best known. Stories about two sons, one good and one bad, are not all that uncommon. And the beginning of our gospel story makes it clear as day that the younger son could never be the good one. And in view of just how shocking this son's behavior is, his father's behavior in granting the request of his inheritance early might be even more surprising. I decided to look up the word prodigal in the dictionary, and I was a little surprised because my own definition or understanding of the meaning of prodigal was wrong. I had drawn the meaning from this parable. So in some ways, I kind of guessed that prodigal meant something along the lines of someone who was wayward or someone who goes on a journey or maybe even it's a metaphorical journey, uh, you know, spiritual, mental, emotional but they go away from home and ultimately return. But I was wrong. The first meaning of prodigal in the dictionary is this, recklessly extravagant. And so yes, maybe the son was recklessly extravagant with his inheritance. But it seems to me that this is actually, this word prodigal is a better description of the father's welcome home party than it is for the younger son. Perhaps this parable would be better named the prodigal father. I mean, is there no limit to this man's joy at the return of his son? And yet, even by asking that question, it kind of betrays our own attitude, right? As being more like the older son, because we're kind of questioning. Is there no limit to this guy's joy? I mean, what's wrong with him? And so, the story. The younger son goes off to a distant land, lives in shameful ways among Gentile foreigners and their pigs, and loses everything he has, which is, we should remember, a very substantial portion of his family's resources. And then he decides to go home. This is also a surprising decision on the young man's part. After the way he has treated his father and his family, he has no grounds on which to expect a generous or gracious reception. I mean, he'd be lucky if he made it back to his father's house, since the moment he was within sight of the village, he would probably be attacked by any person who saw him. You have dishonored your father, you have dishonored your family, you have dishonored us as a village. That's the kind of of law and tradition that was present, this honor and shame culture that was present when the gospels were written. For he has not only shamed his family, but the entire village, where every father would have wondered anxiously whether his behavior would rub off on their, on their own sons, making them rebellious and disruptive and filled with shameful actions. Even if his own father isn't rushing to pick up the first stone, this young man is in real danger from the whole village. But surprisingly, he decides to go back anyway. And surprisingly, his father must have been looking for him, must have been searching the horizon day in and day out, hoping, waiting to catch a glimpse of his son. And then when his father sees him, shamed so profoundly by his younger son's behavior, the father does yet another surprising thing. He gathers up his robes because remember, in those days, people wore long robes especially wealthy people who had slaves and a farm and money, he wasn't expected to work and therefore a a sign or a symbol of his status would have been these long robes that reached basically to the ground. And so think about running in a long robe, right? It's like women trying to run in in a long dress. You can't. And so he would literally have had to hike up his robes and run in order to run. So hiking up his robes, first of all, is shameful. And then running. Running was shameful. No man with high status was going to run on anybody's account. 
And yet here he is with his robes hiked up above his knees, sprinting across his fields to greet his younger son who had shamed him. The father was shameless. And so the combination is undignified in a way entirely unbefitting an elder in the culture in which this story is taking place. But this is not, this is a, not a move just of joy at his son's re return. It's a rescue mission as well. Remember, the father needs to reach the son before the villagers do, or his son is going to fall victim to the mob. And once more, the father sacrifices his dignity and perhaps even risks his own life for this son. But once his father's arms are around that younger son, and especially when he's launched into the celebration, it's clear that this prodigal son is now fully under the protection of his father. And everyone would have known, since everyone would have been invited to the celebration. Right? A fatted calf is not a quarter pounder. And once that fatted calf was killed in a, and butchered in a time when there was no refrigeration, it would need to be consumed very quickly, within the next day or two. And so you need a lot of people to do that. You need one big party, perhaps lasting for a few days. It was not a matter of bringing home leftovers from the restaurant. So let's think about the costs this father has incurred thus far for the sake of this younger son, the bad one, right? The younger son has squandered the family resources, has shown no loyalty to family, father, or village, the father has squandered his dignity once again by lifting up his robes and then running across the field. He has killed a fatted calf that might have gone on to produce more cattle and more wealth to recover some of the wealth that the son, younger son had squandered. He then throws a party to secure his son's status as a full protected member of his family. But the biggest cost is yet to come. And perhaps the biggest shock of the story, the elder son, the supposed good one, the son who, if you take a look from verse 25 on, refuses to even call his father, father. A son who doesn't just shame his father by rejecting his will in the closest thing to private life that village life is. Imagine, right? The, the father goes outside to his son who refuses to go in and begs him to come in, to come in and celebrate and be part of the family. And everybody in the village is inside. But they all saw the father go out. They all would have been like listening at the door, listening at the window. The elder son, as the whole village is gathered, as they began to celebrate, takes this opportunity to show his true colors to his father. He chews out his father in the total and immediate and full view of the village, of all of those gathered to celebrate. In other words, the elder son shows himself to also be a disobedient son, also a dishonoring son, also a son who shames his father. This whole good son, bad son structure becomes like so many other things in Jesus' ministry, becomes a stunning reversal of what is expected, of what is normal. And there's one more surprise yet. In the midst of this public shaming by who is, the one who is supposed to be the good son, the father once more responds graciously, unashamedly, saying even in front of the whole village that the kind of father that he is, he must celebrate and rejoice when the lost are found. The father of the parable celebrates every measure of the resurrection, of life from death, without pausing to judge whether the one given life even deserves it, or what the consequences are for himself or his family or the village or even how the loyal, how the good son will respond. He just hopes that those who profess love and loyalty to him as the father will follow his example. 
And surely that is the question for us, isn't it? The question for all who read this story, when will we follow his example? When will we celebrate this extravagantly, this recklessly extravagantly to ev towards even those who shame us? When will we stop counting the number of times we are wronged, the number of times we are shamed? When will we get past the counting and the judging and simply celebrate the little victories, the incremental changes in ourselves and in others? It's far, far too easy to preach this parable as saying nothing more than God loves you just as you are, come home. I mean, it says that, of course, and it's worth saying, but it says more than that. It invites us. It invites us to consider giving, honor, forgiveness, the joy of our very selves, to give it sacrificially and without regard to the worthiness of our sisters and our brothers. It challenges us to consider what kind of party we'd throw and who would look sideways at us, right? And, and disregard that. Because when the opportunity is presented for renewed fellowship with people, that every kind of common sense, that every ounce of our culture says, uh-uh, that we still throw that party. When will we embrace the example of the Father in this story? That is, after all, the example God gave us, right, in sending the prophets and in sending Jesus. That is, after all, the example Jesus gives at the very beginning of chapter 15 when he invites sinners and the righteous alike, anyone who was willing to sit at the table with him. It is why we gather at our communion table. But it's not until that moment that moment when we think of ourselves as crazy and shameless, as we gather up our robes and as we run to embrace the despised, as we run to embrace those who perhaps have dishonored us or shamed us. It's not until we envelop them in our protection, even from our neighbors, it's not until that moment that we understand just how much God loves us, despite all the times we shame and dishonor God. Friends, that deserves a celebration. Amen. Our hymn, number 670, Amazing Grace. <laughs>